Hello, welcome to BBC World News. The Caribbean island nation Barbados has become the world's newest republic, severing its colonial bonds with Britain nearly 400 years after the first boats arrived there. At the stroke of midnight, President Dame Sandra Mason replaced Queen Elizabeth as head of state. Bells rang out in the capital, Bridgetown, signalling the transition. What? Barbados is ditching the Queen? No, Barbados has ditched the Queen. Little England has ditched the Queen? But why? I thought she was a nice lady. Hi, I'm Dexter and welcome to my channel. I'm a doctor, an academic and a genealogy researcher and I normally make these videos to help you trace your Caribbean ancestors. But something really significant happened this week and I want to discuss it with you. And before I get into that, please subscribe to my channel so that you can get more content helping you trace your Caribbean ancestors. Barbados became a republic and this is something that is very significant. A lot of you will have heard you know, Barbados known as, as Bimsha or Little England and a lot of people were very surprised that they took this, this change in direction. In this video, I'm going to discuss the significance of Barbados becoming a republic and if you watch this video to the end, I'm going to give you some tips on how you can start researching ancestors that have come from Barbados if you've got a connection there. Where's Barbados? Well, I know it pretty well. I lived there for a number of years. I, I did part of my medical training there and I've got loads of friends there. And it's a place that I do have a really soft spot for. Well, Barbados, it's in the Caribbean. You've got North America up here, you've got South America down here, and you've got the islands in between, and then Barbados is the furthest easterly one. So in the 16th century, the Spanish and the Portuguese, they were on the island on and off. They didn't really do much with it. On the 14th of May, 1625, some English sailors, they came onto the island and they claimed it for England in the name of King James I. And the island was later then given to the Duke of Carlisle. The people that were then brought to work there, they were uh, tenant farmers. And so not the splashy elite that we think of now. So we've got Irish and Scottish people and English prisoners that were also sent there to, to, to work. And they were growing the cash crops of the day, so indigo and cotton and that sort of thing. But a bit further north, we've got the tiny island of Nevis, but it's a very important island going back from the very, very beginning of the 17th century. They had already started doing some experiments there with growing sugar and there were some enslaved people that were that were there. In Barbados, a decision was taken to do an experiment growing sugar. So in 1640, we have the arrival of some sugarcane cuttings from Brazil. And these were brought by Dutch traders working together with the English in order to see if they might be able to increase the productivity to scale up production. To cut a long story short, it was a massive success, their, their trial, and they brought some more enslaved people from Brazil and directly from West Africa to then scale this up. And this then started the large-scale cultivation of sugar as the cash crop in Barbados. Now, we've had a number of events happening just after this. We have the English Civil War and a number of royalists fled to Barbados during the time of Oliver Cromwell. And once the monarchy was restored, it realized well the country had been ravaged and they didn't have that much money and there was only so much that could be done in England and so they needed to look to the colonies to get revenue for the treasury. So in the past, the English had been well, stealing from Spanish and Portuguese ships. Now they decided, okay, we need to move forward from, from that because we need to turn this into real business at this point in time. This led to the formation of the Royal African Company in 1660 by the Duke of York, who was the grandson of 
James I. This is quite significant because this granted a monopoly on trade with West Africa. So Guinea, as they were calling it at that time, they could now get as many uh, black people and enslave them and they could then get as much gold as they could find as well for, for trade. This was then followed in 1661 by an act, a very significant act of the Barbados House of Assembly. The formal title is An Act for the Better Ordering and Governing of the Negroes. This is a huge shift in behavior codified within the law where the Black Africans that were enslaved, they were reclassified as chattels. Being a chattel meant that your legal status had been changed from being a person to being property. So the same as cattle and tools. And that change also was accompanied by a restriction in the rights of the children born to black African women where chattels are your property in perpetuity and any children born to any female chattel, those were the property of the enslaver in perpetuity as well. So we now have multi-generational enslavement. Owning land got you a seat inside of the assembly. And if you are owning the land, then you probably have um, some, some enslaved people. And there was a huge incentive to increase the revenue that was going back to England. And therefore, they needed to have better control and a tighter grip on what was happening with what had become the, the largest working group on the island, which were the black Africans, most of whom were enslaved. And we've got a situation where the Irish and Scottish people, they were not coping with the tropical diseases and they really needed to increase production. And this is very specific to what happened in the Americas and this then spread to other parts of what at that time the, the English uh, colonies in Virginia, Georgia, Jamaica, etc, etc, just went, went everywhere. These are known informally as the Barbados Slave Codes and they also had a number of other provisions in, in there. So if you were an enslaver and you just didn't quite like something that one of the enslaved people did, you could beat them, you could torture them, you could even kill them as long as you were just disciplining them. There also were a large number of controls on the movements and whereabouts of black people on the island, both enslaved and those that were not enslaved. This is where you can go and this is where you should be on this day at this time. How many people that can actually gather in this location, clothing you're allowed to wear, where you can cultivate uh, any anything that wasn't for production, if that was permitted, what were the terms of that and whether or not people who were black could own land and how much of the land that you were allowed to have. It just was complete domination and supremacy over the black population. So we have the establishment of a legal framework for what we know now as the plantation economy or the slave society. And having this in place was the beginning of the racialized society, the legacy of which we still live with today. This continued for nearly another 200 years until slavery was formally abolished in 1834. In order for enslaved persons to gain their freedom, however, their enslavers were compensated to the tune of 20 million pounds in 1835. That's equivalent to between 17 and 18 billion in today's money. And the people who were Formerly enslaved, uh, they had to work for another four to six years um, without any pay for their enslaver, even though they were free. So fast forward to 30th November 1966, and Barbados gained its independence 
from Britain and became an independent nation, but remained a realm of the crown. And that is how Elizabeth Regina II became head of state of Barbados. On the 30th of November 2021, Barbados became a republic. They swore in their first president, Dame Sandra Mason, and she has officially replaced Her Majesty the Queen as their head of state. The formal ceremony on the 29th of November 2021 was attended very significantly by the heir to the throne, the Prince of Wales, Prince Charles, and he spoke of the atrocities of enslavement. And I think this is something that is very important given the fact that his ancestors gave the royal warrant for the establishment of it. So I think you can understand why this is a very significant event, Barbados becoming a republic. Because this is the place where we had the slave society codified in law and the industrialized production of sugar perfected. And I think that, uh, you know, having this type of a symbolic, because it it's a symbolic act, but it is an act of decolonization. I do think that it's something that's steeped within some of the academic work that some of the scholars, but particularly Sir Hilary Beckles, have done that have changed the consciousness of the people of Barbados and the wider Caribbean region with regards to decolonization and the importance of this. And we're not just talking about, yeah, we want reparations. We do, but this is an act of reclaiming one's self-confidence to be able to take decisions without having the shadow of the past hanging over you. And this is something that um, you Americans watching, you probably can understand because you did it as well uh, back in 1776. I think that this is very much a poignant moment for people of the West Indian diaspora and people that are descendants of those that were brought from their homes in West Africa and enslaved in the New World, that we are moving forward from this, but we mustn't forget where we came from. The other thing I think that's really significant is that we have the head of state, Dame Sandra Mason, and the Prime Minister, Mia Amal Motley, they're black women. And given it being a full circle moment, you have who is at the bottom? The black woman. And we've turned that on its head and now they're on, on top. So I think that that's really significant. And we have Rihanna. Robin Rihanna Fenty was bestowed a national honor. Uh, she's a culture ambassador for Barbados and has been you know, behind the scenes doing what she can do with her foundation and her background. And I would love to do her genealogy for her if you're watching. From what I can understand, she actually encompasses African diaspora, Irish and Scottish. And I think that having um, such a figure present is very significant and also Rihanna is badass. Right, so you've watched this video to this point and I'm gonna give you some tips on how you can do some research on your ancestors if you're just starting out and you've got a connection to Barbados. So first things first, uh, as I said in my previous video, you can have a look up there, how to get started. You need to go and talk to your, your family and you need to just get some basic information in a notebook and just write down just so that you can get the names of your grandparents and their siblings and your great grandparents as well. Barbados is a very well documented place and their records going back to 1637. And the first bit of records that you need to look at it would be on family search and you need to look at the family search wiki page for Barbados. Quite importantly, there are some birth records, civil birth records going back to 1900 to 1931 that are available. And guess what? They're indexed and they have the images as well. So you can look at all of this information and you can search for it. So this is like a gift. They're giving it to you on a silver platter. 
you need to go right now and have a look at that it's it's really exciting if you like this video give me a thumbs up hit the like button and subscribe to my channel i'm going to continue making more of these i'm looking forward for you to giving me some feedback and i've got an instagram page at island ancestors please follow me there as well to see what i'm posting and as i go and do more research i'm going to post updates see you on the next one Send her victorious. Oh wait, oh no, we're not doing that anymore. Right, um, yeah, um.